Charles for HumbleMechanic.com back today to answer your questions on Service Express. What makes a VW a VW and diagnosing light bulbs out. This is episode 86 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. It's a Monday show, which means I take your questions that you have sent in to me to charles at humblemechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. And that really is the best way for me to filter out any questions that you guys have so that I can get them on a show just like this. All right, before I get into your questions, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP supplies a bunch of manufacturers with OE parts, including timing belts and fluids. They supply Volkswagen and Audi with their DSG fluid. I actually did a show with Mark Malone from CRP Automotive where we talked all about coolant and he gave a really great history of the relationship between CRP Automotive and Volkswagen. So I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to check that out. And you can also check out CRP Automotive at, believe it or not, crpautomotive.com. Okay, let's get into your questions. First comes from Keith. Says, I recently started working Service Express at a local VW dealership. I'm really enjoying the job and I'm definitely feeling myself getting better and better each day. My question is, on average, how long does it take for a new tech to move up into the main shop and what does it take to stand out to the powers that be? Thanks in advance, Keith. Um, Keith, the, the time frame is really like, it, it's, it's huge, right? So we've had techs that have come into the Service Express program and been there for a year and a half and really maxed out at that point. On the other side of that spectrum, we had a guy most recently come in, work his butt off. I mean, he's a really sharp guy. I've talked about him on other shows before. He moved from Service Express to the main shop in about a month and a half. Now, he did have some automotive experience before, but this is the first time ever working as a tech or ever working in a dealership. It really takes the right person to move from Service Express out into the main shop. So it can be anywhere from a month, two months, to a year and a half or more. I think my buddy Matthew spent like six months or so in the Service Express program before they moved him up to the main shop, which I think that is really a good realistic time frame. Six months to a year <clears throat> from starting on day one to where you're put into the shop. And a lot depends on when that happens and why it happens. You basically don't want to rush into this. You want to make sure that you can do all of the jobs that a full line technician can do. Remember in Service Express, you're only doing a small fraction of the work that a line tech or a main shop tech is gonna do. So you can do light bulbs, oil changes, tire rotations, batteries. That's a small scope of being a Volkswagen line tech. So as far as time frame, you know, it could be any, any time. It really depends on you and it depends on what the status of the shop is when the time comes. Now, what can you do to stand out someone that wants to move from Service Express to the main shop? Make sure that your service manager knows, make sure that your team leaders know or your shop foreman knows that that is your goal. Make sure you tell them, I want to move out of Service Express and into the main shop. Now, what you have to do along with that, which is where a lot of guys really miss the mark, is you have to back that up with action. You can't sit and play on your phone when you don't have a car in your bay. Get up and help other technicians, clean the shop. I don't care, just do something. You doing something is gonna set you apart from the guy maybe working next to you that isn't doing a thing. And if you're a Service Express technician, you have access to VW Hub, which is where we get all our education resources, all our self-study programs, all our web-based training, all that is on there. So make sure you're doing that as well beyond just the ones for Service Express. You wanna be a line tech, you need to have a big batch of knowledge before you get to be a line tech so you're not scrambling trying to figure out all this stuff that you didn't know you didn't know all while trying to make a paycheck on flat rate. Plus make sure you're building a good solid tool list to buy for when you're ready to go in the main shop. And keep working hard man, keep hustling. Make sure you're helping other techs when you can. But uh, awesome question Keith and uh, you know keep up the hard work man. So this next one is a very interesting question from Jack and it says the essence of VW no, not another new fragrance, but rather the simple but at the same time complicated question, what makes a Volkswagen a Volkswagen? As per this Top Gear exchange between hosts, you still saying the Golf GTI is the best? Richard Hammond said. Yes, because you see if you buy a Honda, Civic Type R, you end up with a Honda, Jeremy Clarkson. In true Jeremy Clarkson fashion. Um, you know, man, that is kind of an awesome question. Probably one of the few that I really don't have an answer for. There, there's a lot. There's a lot that makes a Volkswagen a Volkswagen. There's a whole, the whole culture, which is really cool. One of the things that I love about the brand is that everyone has a Volkswagen story. Even if you don't drive a Volkswagen, you're 
grandparents had a Volkswagen bus or your buddy had a Beetle going to high school or someone you know, someone you knew, or someone in your family had a Volkswagen and either loved it and it was great or hated it and it was crap. So that's one thing I think that really lends itself to the culture. As far as the car and the driving, it's tough. You know, it's, it's built as a driver's car. And I know a lot of you guys are really gonna disagree with me and how Volkswagen has changed over the years and they're not the same car anymore. And I understand all that. This is just my opinion. This is how I feel about it. I feel like I'm in a different level of car when I'm in a Volkswagen. And, and I like, to, I, just like these guys on Top Gear, I like to compare it to Honda too. I've owned a lot of Hondas and I've owned a lot of Volkswagens. And to me, it's, it's the little things. It's the fit and finish. It's the feel. A lot of things in a Volkswagen to me are just more refined than in a Honda. Now, we can talk reliability and maintenance costs and all that stuff, but let's, let's put all that to the side for a second and talk about just what a Volkswagen is. So again, to me, it's, it's the way the car drives, it's the fit and finish, it's the feel of the car, it's the solid plant on the road. Very reactive steering. You know, my B5.5 Passat, minus the lack of horsepower, is one of the best driving cars that I've ever owned. It definitely drives better and is more comfortable than my Acura CL ever was. Granted, the CL had a bit more horsepower, and again, you know, that's the lacking part on that car. For me, it's about the drive, it's about the experience. Again, this is just, it's my personal opinion. You guys can disagree with me all you want. I know that a lot of you guys are really big Volkswagen fans, and I know a lot of you guys really don't like Volkswagens, and it's cool. You know, that's what's really great about the car culture is, I can love my car for whatever reason I want, you can love your car for whatever reason you want, we can completely disagree, and none of it really matters. So uh, awesome question, Jack. You know, I'm, I'm gonna throw a mid-show question of the day. What do you think makes a Volkswagen a Volkswagen? Okay, next up comes from Tom. He's got two questions, actually. It says, is it necessary to use the locating pins T196 on the mounting bracket when replacing the control arms on the front suspension of a Mark V Jetta to ensure the alignment isn't lost? So what Tom's referring to is small pins that you take some bolts out of the subframe, you install these pins, and then you can drop the subframe in order to take the control arms off the subframe to either replace the bushings or replace the whole control arm. The idea is that if you use these pins, when you put the subframe back up, it goes right back where it was, and there's no need to align the vehicle, set camber, set tow. You just bolt it up, torque your bolts, and you're good to go. You know, for that one, Tom, it's not 100% necessary to use those pins. I've definitely removed subframes and loosened subframes without using those pins and got it back in the right spot. What you can do is where you take the bolts out of the subframe, they generally leave witness marks. So you'll take the bolt out and you'll see a clean ring where the bolt head was. If you get all the bolts lined up right back where those witness marks are, you're gonna get the subframe back in the correct position. Now it's quite a bit easier to use those pins so you don't have to you know, get the bolt snug and then shift the subframe and then tighten it and then shift the backside of it so that you can get them all lined up. So yes, it is quite a bit easier to use those, but it's definitely not something that you have to do. All right, question two from Tom. It's about curb weight position. Are there ways to achieve this position without using the VAG tool T10149 when tightening bolts for bonded rubber bushings on the front suspension? So yeah, have the car on the ground and tighten it that way. <laughs> um, that's the easiest way to do it, Tom. You know, it's hard to get underneath in those positions when your vehicle's on the ground, especially if you have a modified vehicle. Let's say it's lowered, like my cabby, for example. You're not getting under there with any kind of tool to tighten anything. So what I do generally at the shop is put the car on the alignment rack, raise the alignment rack up, and it's quite a bit easier to get underneath to tighten any bolts. Obviously, most people don't have access to, you know, a $50,000 or whatever it costs uh, alignment machine, so we need to explore other options. One thing we can do is we can jack the car up and set it down on ramps. So you have your front wheels, you can drive it up on the ramps, you can lift the back end up and set it on another set of ramps. It does require you have four ramps, but that's gonna probably be the easiest and the cheapest way to get all the wheels loaded up so that you can torque your bolts down. You know, I don't like the idea of doing things like using a jack to, to raise the tire up so that corner is loaded. It's a little sketchy, you know, what if the jack slips and what if the tire moves and the jack goes shooting out? You know, it's, it's a little bit dangerous. I don't really love the idea. Those ramps aren't terribly expensive. I've had mine for probably 15 years or something like that and they look kind of beat up, 
but I know they weren't that expensive when I bought them. That's also one of those things that you can find for almost next to nothing at garage sales. So I would recommend doing it that way if you're doing it at the house, if you cannot get underneath the vehicle without lifting it at all. Oh, and back to the locating pin question, I would probably recommend getting an alignment done either way. If you're having issues with the control arm bushings beyond just squeaking, I would wanna make sure that my alignment is good. So good luck, Tom, and uh, let us know how it turns out. All right, next one comes from Dan. Dan's got a long question. I was wondering if you could give me some insight to potential issues on the Mark 7 GTI. EA888 Gen 3 engine issues or lack thereof. I know the KO3 had a few issues, but my uncle who works for VW said that the engine had timing chain tensioner issues causing the timing to get out of time and subsequently bend the valve. He also said the rear main seals leak and mentioned the carbon buildup, which has to be expected on any direct injection engine. I know you have some videos about those failing parts for the older engines, but I was curious, has VW made any changes to the EA888 Gen 3 to resolve these nuances? I also know the Mark VI GTI had intake issues as you've shown your videos, and I was curious if that's still an issue. So, Dan, that's that's a couple of really good questions. Um, first of all, the chain tensioner issues and the rear main seal issues run the Mark VI generation. So that's gonna be your CCTA and your CBFA engine code. This is a different engine. It's a totally different engine, and I haven't seen those issues on this engine, the new EA888 at all. Here are the issues that I have seen with the EA888. I've seen a couple of intake manifold sensor issues. Now, this sensor is not built into the intake manifold and it is replaceable separately. So it takes it from, you know, a three hour job and a whatever $300, $400 part to like an $80 sensor and probably 15 minutes worth of work. So taking care of that issue, even though I'm seeing a little bit of parts failures, the issue of having to replace the manifold has been taken care of. We have replaced one engine at the shop, and that was on a brand new car with 80 miles, some kind of low end knock. I don't know, we didn't take it apart because Volkswagen wanted the engine back intact. So I don't know what the issue ended up being, but that was the one engine repair that we have had to do. We've also had a turbocharger as well that I did do a video on that. I haven't had the intake manifold off of a GTI yet, so I don't know whether they're having carbon buildup issues or not. The thing that I have seen the most of overall on the Mark 7 is really transmission issues. It's low miles, it's early on, some kind of tone ring on one of the gear shafts that's causing DSG issues. So we've been putting DSG boxes, we've replaced five or six. We have seen some wheel bearing failures, we have seen some axle failures. Nothing that I'm really alarmed about, it does really raise a little bit of concern for me. As far as predicting future issues, man, I, I don't know. You know, when, when Volkswagen releases a car and I think, wow, this car is going to be really bad and we're going to have all kinds of problems with it, it turns out to be fine. When I think that this car is going to be great and we're not going to have any issues with it, that's the one where we get recall after recall after recall or update after update after update, or we're replacing part after part after part. But those big time catastrophic ones, Dan, that you mentioned, all that seems to be taken care of and uh, I wouldn't give timing chain tensioners on the new generation a worry just yet. All right, I got time for one more. This one comes from Josh. He says, I have a problem with my 03 18 Turbo Jetta. The driver's side DRL light has failed. I still get reverse and brake and turn indicator on that side, just not the DRL. I put a new bulb in, it still won't work. I'm wondering if you know how I could diagnose this. Could you possibly do a VW parts fail video on the subject? Thanks in advance, Josh. So Josh, the first thing with any light you replace the bulb, good job. That's usually what I do first too, because that's generally the thing that's wrong with it. Now that we've replaced the bulb, we need to make sure that we have the correct bulb. We need to make sure we have the bulb installed in the correct port. Sometimes the best thing to do is pull the other side out and compare them both together. Now, if all that's good, let's move up to the front of the car and check the fuses. I have done a video on how to check fuses on my Passat, which is a very similar fuse panel to your Jetta. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check that out. I don't know which fuse it is, from what I remember, the lighting circuits on that generation is the small fuses up on the top, more towards the right as you're looking at the fuse panel. You can also swap the entire bulb carrier from the left side to the right side. Or if it's a headlight, you can swap the entire headlight from the left side to the right side as a very easy test to see what's working and what's not. Now, if you have a test light or a power probe or some type of diagnostic, a multimeter, you can use that. Make sure you have power when you're supposed to. Make sure you have ground when you're supposed to. You can have someone turn the lights on and off and check on the wires and see where you have power when they turn it on and no power when they don't. There's a lot of really quick, easy tests to do, again, like swapping the bulb holders in order to quickly diagnose this issue. You may find that you've ran out of ideas after doing all that stuff. Now it's time to start chasing wires, depending on 
what you find. So do some quick swaps, get yourself a test light, heck, get yourself a power probe, they're better anyway. Make sure you got power, make sure you got ground, man. That's what it takes to make a light bulb work. But good question, Josh, and uh, keep us all posted on how it goes. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. If you want a question answered on a show like this, email me, charles at humblemechanic.com, and put question for Charles in the subject. Hey, if you liked the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Oh, and we don't have a beer of the day because it's later than I wanted to shoot the show, so we have a water of the day in a uh, Holy Grail ale mug.